Uh, this presentation is about um, an introduction to free and open source software. And uh, we try to see why it is uh, important. Someone would say it's still important today. And uh, small print there says free and open source software technologies. I didn't make that up. It's, uh, it's actually my uh, ac academic uh, achievement. That's my, uh, the, title of my, the title of my master. And um, it's, uh, it's going to be probably a boring presentation, if, especially if you're into software, because I'm going to go through some history, some legal issues, but I'll try to keep, uh, to keep the rhythm up so you don't fall asleep. So, so, um, so the first thing we need to uh, introduce is what is software. You probably already know. Uh, every time I don't know something, um, I'll ask Wikipedia. And uh, it comes out with this definition, which I'm not really happy about. It says, it's a part of a computer system that consists of data or instructions and immediately introduce the contrast with the hardware, which is fine. But then at this point, uh, I prefer the definition I'm used to, that's uh, this one. Um, and it's that part of the system that you can't actually kick when it stops working. That's uh, what uh, my teacher at university explained me. So this is more or less, uh, uh, th these are two definitions we can be okay with. But actually, software is uh, it's more complex than just, the, the just saying, okay, it's that part of the technology you can't touch. Um, because it's made of uh, mathematics and it's, make, it's made of uh, algorithms. Uh, and we know that uh, algorithms are these formal methods that uh, help you solving problems. So uh, it's a kind of a, a process, software creation, that involves uh, uh, mainly two actors. Uh, it's uh, the human brain and uh, some sort of machine, right? And at some point, the human brain comes up with an idea. And uh, it wants to describe this idea to the machine in a formal way, in an unambiguous, deterministic way. And that's how software is created. It's basically using a language. We transform our idea into mathematical thought, if you want. We write a set of rules for the machine to execute uh, in, a, in a specific order. And then uh, we give it to the machine, and the machine will produce the expected result. Uh, so that's more the bigger view on, uh, on software and uh, the process of creating software. But associating this with computers, well, and unless you, you, you consider this a computer, which was actually the famous uh, uh, Babbage uh, uh, analytical engine, which is completely mechanical, so it doesn't use transistors uh, or integrated circuits as uh, we're used to today. Um, but it was already possible to write software for this machine. This machine uh, was made in the, in the early uh, 18th, uh, uh, 19th century, so in 1800 something. And this person was the person who, uh, the first time, theorized the existence uh, of something uh, such as software. You know, so you probably know her already. She's uh, Lady Lovelace. Uh, she was the daughter uh, of Lord Byron, one of the most important uh, uh, um, figures in the English literature, and uh, she actually managed to write. The first piece of software, which is already, which is still available uh, in a museum, and it's of course public domain. And uh, and she realized actually that machines that are not made for a single purpose, but like that, like Babbage um, analytical engine, can actually do whatever you want. So she said, the analytical engine has no pretensions to do something uh, on its own. It's, it's about us instructing it through 
a number of steps to do something. So that's what software is. That's the first definition of software back in 1842. Well, she also said other things like uh, this brain of mine uh, is uh, more than merely mortal. Uh, uh, the time will show. And she was right, actually, because she's a genius, so lol. Um, what was actually very important for the definition of software itself, it's a bit like the second half of the last century. It's a bit of a strange history because everybody tells it in their way. So I'm mentioning uh, uh, some people rather than others. Uh, but we can all agree on the fact that uh, the hacker ethics is actually created before the computers were accessible to people. And, uh, and the goal was actually to have access to those computers to do something because it was something that, that was reserved for uh, university, for like the old professors uh, to play with or big uh, corporations like uh, IBM. But there was like, uh, the development of the Ackle culture uh, it came before the existence of software itself. And uh, okay, we can also include Lady Lovelace uh, in, in this terminology because actually what was her problem? She, she had this huge machine and uh, nobody knew how to make it work. So she had to invent something, uh, a language to talk to it. And also she wrote programs that could run on this hypothetical machine, even if uh, it was not built uh, before another 30 years. But these guys, uh, um, back in the 40s, uh, uh, were enthusiastic about um, building uh, train models because it was something that you could actually disassemble, reassemble, and uh, tune, optimize. Uh, so it had something to do with the way we are used now to, uh, to look at things. So this group of uh, people, uh, it's like, uh, the, the model uh, railroad, uh, railroad club uh, at some point uh, became students at MIT. They were already in Massachusetts and, uh, uh, and they, they met this uh, professor, this uh, professor Marvin Minsky, who uh, gave them the access to this big powerful machine, this uh, TX0, and, um, and was available for them to, to play and learn during off time. What, uh, what was the outcome? In, in a few years, these guys were able to write the first video game to theorize uh, uh, um, AI, to learn, to, to teach the, the, the computer to play chess, and uh, even to invent the second oldest programming language known to humans, and uh, still the oldest one that's still in use today, that's Lisp. So, in other words, they helped a lot defining uh, the software as we know it today. But what they, was, they were starting as well was the, the, um, the, hacker, uh, the hacker community that was starting uh, in these days at MIT and later on even in California, uh, when some, some of them uh, moved to Berkeley and met other people that, uh, that uh, made the history during the 60s and the 70s and they theorized the, the, the points they were the first one to theorize the points of the hacker ethics actually so way before the era of the personal computer and that's that's mostly because of the struggle to access these kind of technologies that were something for for an elite of people and still will remain like that until the personal computers will get to uh, to everyone so what are these ethics? And I think this is still very uh, uh, actual. It's, for, for it's something that was written thinking about today in a way. It's, uh, I'm impressed by this, uh, uh, these points here. It's like, OK, maybe we don't have the, the top problem anymore, because accessing uh, uh, technology hands-on, it is still a struggle if the technology is uh, proprietary or closed source, but we will get there later. Um, but all the other ones 
All information should be free. Not even your own information is free to access to yourself. Yeah, they're fixing that now, but very slowly. Mistrust authority, promote decentralization. It's, uh, I've seen a nice uh, uh, graffiti entering here. It's like uh, the ideas uh, should never stand back. And that's about it. If you think something, you should not uh, just go with the flow. If you have good ideas, you should um, always try to build something out of it, not to centralize everything. And uh, well, there was already a big deal of inclusion in the, in the, in the, in the fourth point there, um, because we, it was very early to say that uh, hackers should be judged on what they do and not what they are for age, race, sex, gender, whatever. And uh, this is very important because, yes, you can create art and beauty on a computer. When I explain a non-technical friend uh, what I do, uh, I, I tell them that uh, my, mine is a very creative job and uh, I really enjoy doing art with the computer. But uh, actually what I do is I write software for microelectronics, for the microelectronic industry. So from, from, the, from the outside point of view, I understand that they struggle to understand, to, to to just focus on the on the artistic and creative part of my job, but doing uh, like writing software is something very special. And of course, well, it took a while for us to understand, but computers can change our life for the better. Um, well, in the 70s, um, uh, some some of the of these MIT students uh, moved to to California. And uh, someone uh, like this student uh, called Bill Gates uh, started uh, writing the basic uh, programming language and he founded already Microsoft back in 1975. Uh, and meanwhile, Steve Wozniak was building the Apple II in his garage and the other Steve uh, was ready to sell it because uh, he was already then uh, pretty good uh, business uh, uh, person. But what does it mean that uh, the hacker community, these guys, these uh, uh, enthusiasts, got to providing personal computer to, to the people way before th the big figures there, there like the big corporates uh, at the time, HP and IBM, could even figure out there was such a market. So they got there first. Um, what happened afterwards is like home computer were introduced. We start having all this nice Commodore 64 or uh, Sinclair Spectrum at home. And uh, I was a kid. I did have a Sinclair Spectrum. I remember that I could go to uh, the newspaper shop in the 80s and buy those cassettes with, uh, with video games on it. But they were not the original video games because they were cloned from the originals, translate to Italian, with a completely different name. Sometimes even the sprites were changed because the source code was there. Nobody actually had the idea of ownership of the software. You create software, but it's like writing down um, an, an algebraic equation, for instance. It's not something that they could think about having some kind of uh, 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 ownership on it, some kind of uh, copyright, that, that, that came later. So the software actually was already born free in the sense that uh, everyone could do whatever they want with it. Just before we, or some company, realized that uh, it was easy money to do it. Like you make software once, you copy it as many times as you want, and you can sell license fees for each copy you, you sell. So it's, uh, it's, it's a nice business model. So the legislation kind of uh, followed um, these indications from, uh, from, the, um, uh, from the companies. And of course, the copyright law was modified in many uh, countries in Europe to include software as it was a novel or a piece of music or uh, uh, a painting. 
So that's how the, the two words met. But before that, proprietary software never existed. So some people that were like a bit concerned about this, it's like we're introducing the concept of copyright and ownership on, uh, on something like software that we, as, an hacker com as a hacker community, we always consider something that was public for everyone. But that's uh, a normal process, of course, because if you write something uh, and it starts to have that artistic value I was talking about, so it's not that bad to have this kind of regulation. It's just that uh, this guy, Stalman, was um, very against it, and he started his own project. And he started writing this GNU project, because the most popular uh, operating system at the time was Unix. Uh, but it also came with the strong ownership from, uh, from big companies. So he said, I'm going to write one that's free for everyone. But he hadn't yet theorized what the license model should have been. That came a bit later, later on. This project uh, was not very successful in the 80s or the beginning of the 90s, but for a simple reason. Uh, these guys seem to fail to write the core component, the, the kernel, where this operating system could, could run on. But yeah, probably you already know the story. This uh, um, young uh, student in 1991, Torvalds, sent the email saying, saying uh, hey, I wrote this uh, uh, kernel. And, uh, that turns out to be the missing component uh, for the GNU project. But in the meanwhile, what happened in the 90s is that uh, personal computers were replacing these home computers that we had in the 80s. And uh, there was one strong player, that was the Microsoft, that was founded back in uh, 1995 and had a lot of project products. Uh, and uh, they tried to lock in the users with all the ways they could. So. Um, even um, making some versions of the software available to, to the public for free, uh, especially on the office side, um, to ensure that uh, people are forced in a way to stay in that railway of technology that they defined so they can guarantee uh, the return on revenue on those products. The problem is there is nothing wrong with it. That's uh, how the market works. The problem is that uh, this process uh, also in englobated the uh, public administration in many cases, which means that a lot of public money started flowing on a single big player in the market uh, uh, already back in the 90s. But it was already happening uh, since the introduction of copyright, of course, and the commercialization of software. Um, Linux in the meanwhile, in the 90s, uh, at the beginning it was just a few followers of this Torvald Torval guy, mostly uh, people that are very enthusiastic about programming uh, in C with the system and, um, and decide what, uh, uh, what, what the system, uh, the public system for everyone will look like. But it starts leaving its niche, it starts con con conquering uh, parts of the of the technology that uh, uh, where it actually makes a difference, so mostly the server. So web servers, uh, uh, most web servers switched to free and open source solution running on Linux uh, uh, already very early in the days. And a few new companies are, are born on uh, defining a different uh, market value than just selling license fees. And I'm uh, talking about Red Hat, SUSE, and uh, other companies that have contributed uh, making Linux great, making Linux what it's today, by investing money in, uh, uh, in the development of this free software and moving a bit, shifting uh, the development of Linux uh, from, uh, uh, from the basement uh, of uh, hobbyists to an actual corporate uh, uh, environment. Uh, so also introducing different kind of uh, uh, quality metrics, uh, etc. And their business model is not anymore um, uh, on, on, on license fees, but it's based on selling services 
or other more complex business models that we're not, we're not discussing here. Um, then again, what happened in 2000? The good, pop good software, as in well-written, it became popular, popular again because uh, a lot of network uh, devices like uh, uh, your routers and access points at home uh, are being replaced with Linux machines. Linux becomes mostly popular on the mobile market thanks to Google that makes this uh, open source not new version of Linux uh, that runs on uh, half of the mobile phones in the world. And this company Apple that has seen 10, 15 years of uh, dark age with uh, dubious uh, um, products on the market uh, suddenly against popularity again, which is good because it gives a bit of uh, uh, um, diversity on the market because uh, you're not anymore uh, tied to one single brand, so this way you make space for the for the third one. Um, yes, there is a, a few good achievements that we have uh, had uh, in the past two decades, and uh, especially uh, we know that good technology, well-written software, can prevail on the market because when the companies are interested in uh, how things work. It's not anymore about how much money you spend, but it's uh, the results that, uh, that, uh, that you achieve. So there is some kind of uh, victory for someone who lived this from the inside. It's, uh, um, it feels good to have Linux uh, as one of the, uh, as the most important probably software project right now in the world. And, uh, so much popular uh, in almost everyone's pocket. But let's go back for a moment on what is software. So software is made of what? It is made of ideas, it's made of uh, algorithms, and it's made of solutions, but it's... So it's a, it's a matter of form rather than substance. That's uh, the things that you don't find in software, like uh, atoms or molecules or something that compose matter. So why do I get here? Because some people still, especially politicians, don't understand this separation. So they still treat software as a product, as something you can sell. But uh, it's just a matter of form. It's if, you, if you get two programmers and you tell them to write the same thing, they will use two different technologies, probably two different programming languages, and come out with some, something that they, they don't look like each other, but probably in the end they will do the same thing. So look at how many possibilities ha we have for a s every single uh, uh, software that, uh, that, we can, uh, that we can use nowadays. And that's because different uh, communities, different groups, different companies have worked on a similar product, but they're not exactly the same. But this is not plagiarism because if you start from a, from, a, from a blank sheet, you can start writing a novel yourself and uh, it's just a matter of form. Um, if the butler is, uh, is the killer in my uh, police novel, uh, it would be already in several of them, but it doesn't mean that it, it needs to look like the others. So the software ownership, it is a matter of form. It is never a matter of content. So if I do something, and you do something that looks similar to it, to the user's eye, it doesn't mean that we use the same code. And if we, if we didn't, those are two different things. So all these words on patents, uh, you, you can imagine it's just pointless, because we, we're talking about two different recipes to make uh, Chicano gratin. But if, it's, if it tastes good, it's not, it's not plagiarism. So this is important because a lot of companies, corporate lobbies, have tried to introduce the, um, the concept of software patents. And they've, they've been trying for years, actually. And uh, it might even look nice uh, as a concept because it means that, uh, you know, when you put a patent on something, uh, you need to release every single bit about it. 
to say from the Latin patere, which means to lay open, to show to the universe. And, uh, but this only applies to physical things. Like if I, if I do this, I design it for the first time. It's a nice object. I can put a patent on it. And then uh, I will exclude all my competitors to produce it because that's my invention. And, uh, but this is as a cost for me to produce. It has a cost for me to put on the market. It is different. It's not a concept. I can put patents and concepts. So this is just pointless, R right? It's uh, luckily we still resisting uh, from uh, introducing this kind of model on software, and that's uh, not mm, that's not the case everywhere. Because in the U.S., if you're powerful enough, you can still put patents on software, so you can still patent ideas, which is a bit scary. What are the regulations about software? Software is regulated by uh, the, uh, we've seen the copyright law, so you can't sell it. So when you say, I bought that product from that uh, uh, software company, you didn't buy the product. You actually signed a contract with them that's very similar to a rental contract uh, when you rent a new house. It's, it's, uh, it's about, defining uh, what you're allowed and not allowed to do within the boundaries that who granted you the software license decide for you. And you can decide, of, of course, to accept uh, or, um, uh, or not that this kind of uh, contract, but that's still how it works. You don't buy actually anything. Software is not a product. And that's actually how it is regulated uh, in European countries uh, through the copyright law. Um, so these licenses, basically, the, the proprietary licenses uh, are there to put um, walls and borders around where you could move while using the software. Open source licenses are just the opposite. Uh, as we've seen, they, they were created as a reaction to the introduction of proprietary, proprietary software because that, that never existed before the 80s. To put back things as they were before. And uh, yeah, this, the whole discussion of course implies that, uh, that you read the software uh, agreement, uh, um, the terms of agreement of the software that, uh, that you're gonna use, but you are bound to agree to the rules that are written there. Um, so the open source world, to make it really, really, really simple, has basically two approaches. The number one approach is permissive licenses. It's like the BSD license. It's, a, it's what is normally called open source uh, in, in, a broader, in a broader sense. And uh, the BSD license says, do whatever you want, basically, except to us. Um, but on the other hand, you'd be so kind if you really, really become rich with it, you should still uh, mention the original authors uh, in your copyright notice to give them some glory. That's what open source looks like, which is not, the, not really ideal because if I'm a big company and uh, I'm really interested in, uh, in the software that Wouter is, is, uh, is writing, I can just steal it, make it better, not release it back to the open source. He will still keep his own version, which is lagging behind because in the meanwhile I had new features, I, had it, uh, I fixed some bugs, I'll never tell him, and uh, my version is clearly better. I invested money and time on it, so I'll sell it on the market. But what comes back to the original developers <coughs> is clearly nothing. Uh, so the same guy behind GNU, uh, Richard Stallman that wanted to have Unix for everyone. Um, he invented this new kind of license, uh, it's a free software license, uh, uh, the, the also called the GNU general public license, uh, which is different because it's less permissive. So it's a bit of a uh, uh, clash with the term free, but 
The term free in this case means you need to provide freedom to your next user. And it's done through the four freedoms. So the freedom number zero, and it's exactly the opposite as proprietary software. So closed source is only one part of the problem. Freedom zero is use it for whatever purpose you want, so anything, even to make weapons or whatever. We don't care because you're free to use the software uh, for any purpose that was designed for some purpose probably, but you're free to re-adapt uh, it to anything. Um, you're free to study it because what's the point of running something if you don't know what's inside it? Uh, it's just a black box and uh, you don't get very much uh, from it. Or at least you are kind of uh, one of the machines in the, in, the, in the distributed system because you're using it, but just through the path that you were indicated. So you're, you're making basically a set of uh, predictable steps. So you're like the, the, the Babbage uh, machine basically, but you're just facing another machine. So it's, it's a bit sad. The fact that you can't actually read the code, that's probably one of the, the parts that, uh, that the people like the, the least. But, but also, uh, not just, if you stop there, you get something that's called the micro shared source license, I think works like this. So you're free to use it and you're free to look into it, but that's it. Don't even think about touching it. But what I want to do with this software is changing it and making it better. Because water software is great, but it has a few things that can be improved. So I just move uh, towards action and improve uh, the software water. But not for myself, for everyone. Because the rule number three, that's the last uh, of the four rules, says you are entitled to redistribute all the derivatives, but you must keep granting the four licenses to the next per to the four freedoms to the next person so the software st should still be within the same license so some people call this viral but it's, it's not bad it's actually it keeps the market fair it keeps uh, the ecosystem working so i'd rather use something like this for software i write than the uh, open source permissive licenses. But of course, this is always a matter of uh, bias and taste and personal history and whatever. They are obviously both have um, a good history of nice project uh, uh, and working uh, track also in, uh, uh, in trials, so in, uh, uh, in actual uh, low environment. Uh, so there are communities that uh, were able to uh, um, to sue big companies because they violated one of those uh, uh, freedoms. So this is powerful. This is powerful weapon. But of course, a lot of companies yeah think that this is viral because oh my god, uh, all our source uh, is uh, immediately becoming uh, free for everyone. But making software, making money on uh, software licenses is some legacy we have from the past. It's uh, not a, a, a model that's working still in 2018. It's we now sell services, we sell experience. We don't sell software licenses. That clashes a bit with, with the degree of technology we have reached uh, so far. And uh, if you open your code, it doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, you're not going to make money with it because there are many um, business models that are that are based on uh, on free and software and open source software licenses. Yes, probably you're not making billions, probably you're not like founding uh, Microsoft again, but I don't think that uh, there are like uh, historical uh, um, uh, basis to to do something like this right now. What we should be focused on should be mostly um, a way to guarantee a, a fair market for everyone to get in from uh, small software artisans uh, to the big company everyone should be able to make money with with what they do because software development uh, is is a hell of a job it's very fun but uh, it means you lose sleep and uh, 
it impacts on your life uh, in a way. So you want to get some uh, something back from it. But of course, there, is a, there are many ways to do this. And of course, there is always these companies that say, no, we don't release our source code because we don't like it. It's, uh, and my doubt is always the same. Are they not releasing it because their code is uh, damn ugly? And I can assure you, I've seen some code that was not released under an NDA from some customers I worked for, and that's the case 90% of the time. They don't want to show the code because the code sucks, because it's uh, completely unreadable, it's difficult to maintain, and they don't want to associate those lines of code to their logo. That's why companies don't release software on open source licenses most of the time. Because there is not much of a huge advantage right now for how the things have changed to keep proprietary software closed source um, on, on software products. So, <coughs> proprietary software is not always paid. It can be free as in gratis. So, free as in uh, free beer, let's say. But not as in freedom, not as in the for freedom. Eh? Uh, but it doesn't mean that it lock, doesn't lock you in because it doesn't ask you money. It can still be like completely closed source. This is uh, the this is the case probably for thousands of uh, apps for uh, for the mobile phone. They don't ask you money, but you will never be able to see the code, and that's also bad because we're we're not fighting against the uh, the high price of the software here. We, we're fighting against the, the whole concept of uh, hiding uh, your technology in something uh, that's that you don't want to show to the other people how it works. So, and, that's, and of course, from uh, for for people like. Hackers, uh, this is a bit annoying. It is frustrating because you you will never know how it works. Uh, you have no ideas who wrote it. You need to be trusting them 100%. So if you get a computer and you put your nice Apple operating system or Windows operating system, uh, you will never know what it is doing uh, in its core because the so the the, the you, you're not able to, to look at the and actually, uh, the, the software, I, how it was written. So, <coughs> and also limits all the other kinds of licenses, uh, of uh, freedom, sorry, that, uh, that are granted in the, in the free software license. Uh, because normally in a EULA, in an in a end user license agreement uh, of one of those software, they state clearly what kind of actions you can perform and what you cannot. And, uh, for sure, it won't let you copy it to your friends. Um, and there is this funny clause, as many proprietary systems uh, include, which is completely invalid in, uh, within the EU. That's against the reverse engineering. So let's say you want to know how something works, and you start tearing it apart and checking each component and trying to figure out, a bit as you did, with your toys when you, when you were a kid, or with your PlayStation 3 when you had to modify it. Or you, you can do the same thing with, the, with software. There are like uh, programs like these assemblers that let you know what actions the machine is, uh, uh, is performing uh, step by step. Please keep using those. Keep looking inside the software and check what it is doing, even if the code is not available. Because even if the license says it's, uh, you can't do that, well, as long as you are within the European Union, it's, uh, it's uh, your own damn right to do it, to start checking and, and seeing why uh, uh, the software is behaving in that specific way. And of course, that's, that's a very, very um, sad note about proprietary, so proprietary software. It's like a, a lot of the money in the public, in the public administration is still going uh, uh, to big software corporations, uh, to licenses that are granted to a specific structure. Just imagine, I don't know how many hospitals are in Brussels, uh, probably eight or 10. Just imagine each one of those hospitals need to buy license for the same software many, many times. And it's, it just adds up to the, to the cost. 
if we had a different way of doing these things, that would be much more, it would, it would be much better for our society, but also much more convenient for our pockets because a lot of public money go there. So probably a lot of your taxes go there as well. And uh, OK, I have a video to show you uh, which explains why uh, if, it, if the software is, is done for the, for, the, for the public purpose, it should be public itself. And so open source and, and free as well. I'm really eager to show it to you. OK, so video. Treat our public infrastructure like our streets and public buildings the same way it treats our digital infrastructure. Our members of parliament would work in a rented space where they weren't allowed to vote in favor of stricter environmental laws because the owner, a multinational corporation, didn't allow that kind of voting in its buildings. Nor will it allow a long overdue upgrade to more than 500 seats. This means some members of parliament have to stay outside in the street. And a couple of blocks away, a brand new gym is already being torn down just six months after it was built. It's being replaced with an exact replica at great expense. And the only difference, the new manufacturer also provides street ball as an added feature. Meanwhile, every night through a hidden back door in the city hall, documents that contain sensitive information on citizens, from bank data to healthcare records, are being stolen. But no one is allowed to do anything about it because searching for back doors and locking them would infringe the Southern User Agreement. And as absurd as this sounds, when it comes to our digital infrastructure, things like the software and programs that our governments are using every day, this comparison is pretty accurate. Because mostly, our administrations procure proprietary software. This means a lot of money goes into licenses that last for a limited amount of time and restrict our rights. We aren't allowed to use our infrastructure in a reasonable way. And because the source code of proprietary software is usually a business secret, finding security holes or deliberately installed backdoors is extremely difficult and even illegal. But our public administrations can do better if all publicly financed software were to be free and open source, we could use and share our infrastructure for anything and for as long as we wanted. We could upgrade it, repair it, and remodel it in any way to fit our needs. And because the open source in free software means that the blueprint is openly readable for everyone, this makes it much easier to find and close security holes. And if something practical and reliable was created digitally, not only can you reuse the blueprint all over your country, but the actual thing itself can be deployed anywhere, even internationally. A great example of this is Fix My Street, originally developed in Great Britain as a free software app to report, view and discuss local problems like potholes, it's now being used all over the world. Everyone benefits because new features and improvements are shared by everyone. If all our software were developed like this, we could stop struggling with restrictive licenses and could start thinking about where and how software could help us. We could concentrate on creating a better society for everyone. So if you think that tomorrow's infrastructure should be in our own hands. Help us now by sharing this video and visiting our website, publiccode.eu. It's time to make our demand. Public money, public code. Okay. So, you worried yet? Um, what are the actions that we can do at this point? Uh, as a user, it could be more critical. Uh, there are alternatives to the software that you use to uh, every day. Uh, okay, sometimes this means being out of your network of your hands for a, 
uh, your the latest uh, messaging or social media, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I've been through this, and uh, that's not that bad. I mean, it just if you are a developer, it's even better because it just pushes you in improving what's what's already there. But as a developer, you can do much. You can learn new stuff. That's number one. If you stop learning, uh, it's just stuck again in the same kind of technology and that's something you can't afford. Software itself is something that's moving and uh, developers can't be static, so never sit down on your own knowledge. Just uh, if you think you know too much, just go ahead and, and learn something new. And there are so many interesting technologies and so many interesting communities out there in the open source and free software uh, uh, world that uh, just they're just waiting for you basically and they're all eager to uh, to uh, to guide you through their own technology because they're usually very passionate about the what they did uh, so yeah start contributing start start your own project but most important uh, join some communities there is uh, in Brussels there is the hacker space there is uh, self informatic here at uh, TLB it's uh, uh, it's this kind of uh, um, Technology, um, knowledge enhancement places because you get there, you show people what you've done, people will show you what what they have done, and you both you both come out very enriched by that. Uh, of course, there is stuff that companies can do as well, like sponsors open open source projects and ideas for their uh, employees to evolve, because that also means that they are learning new things and becoming better professional. Adopt open standards, so start uh, refusing uh, lock-ins policies like a uh, big company can come out tomorrow with a new uh, way of uh, uh, visualizing web pages uh, that they decided on their own, but uh, it was not like, they didn't go through a research, a scientific path that uh, open standards and protocols and technologies went through to assess a wider range of problems uh, that are not specific for a, for a, for a single business model. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, it's, it's all about the, the, the mentality of not hiding stuff. It's just showing what you can do. But new battles are there, it's, just, it's not just uh, the fact of the uh, of the closed door proprietary software that's warring the technological society, and that has to do with the with the with the hacker ethics uh, we discussed earlier, because the new battle is actually played on decentralization. Um, free and open software is not enough alone; it has been a powerful weapon, but it's not enough. Because big companies have learned from their mistakes and they start englobating uh, uh, open source software. They learned how to use it and how to get through communities, alter licenses, make them sign contribution agreement, etc. And uh, but be careful because the, the goal of the of the free software community is not to destroy capitalism. Even if, in my own opinion, it would be a nice side effect, but on, uh, in general, we are not like trying to mine uh, the profit. We're trying to make the market more fair, more ecologic from the society point of view. And um, so if you promote free software, and uh, especially free software, not just open source, you allow individuals to grow uh, and small companies can compete again with large enterprises. And uh, still, the GPL license is, the, I think, the most powerful political but also legal tool that we have to, to, in to increase the, 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 this kind of fairness um, and equity on the market, uh, where small players, again, can become rich, can go through that hope of developing different software in a different way. And of course, be aware of one thing. In the open source world, there is a lot of false friends, a lot of people that say, we are friends of open source, we support open source, we've 
even contributed to the Linux kernel. And uh, they go around and organize this kind of, uh, well, it's not just all, all big corporates, even local Belgian companies will invite you to hackathons where you're supposed to write software for their own idea or promote your own idea or kind of, uh, I don't know, summer camp uh, where, where you write software for them. But be careful because licenses are very important uh, in, uh, in these cases because if someone is uh, telling you to develop open source software, you just need to go one step further and say, is this also free software? Because if it is not, I'm basically improving your own proprietary mm, services that you, mm, that you do with my open source software. So I'm not against it. I'm just saying, if you think I'm good, just pay me because developers need to eat as well, right? So. Even if people ask you to write open source software, that's not something that, that came from yourself or from your own community. Just please ask for money because it's not acceptable that big companies get cheap labor. And, uh, and yeah, beware of marketing, especially big news titles because big companies normally pay the press to, to put their, the, the best technology uh, in, the, in, the, in the first page. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not that bad. I mean, you can build your own career on, on uh, open source software. Of course, you need to be uh, ready to sacrifice some, of some parts of your life, like sleeping. Uh, that's uh, not something you, you're going to do, because especially if you have like, full-time work or you're a student and you're very busy with your, with your schedule and uh, you do other things in your life, you, you'll have to, to find some some time for your hobbies, but that's uh, for everything, of course. Huh? And, uh, but if you have the hacker mentality, and everyone a little bit has it, I think, it just it depends on uh, how much you develop it and, uh, in, your, in your younger years. Um, if you want to know how things actually work, and if you're interested in the tearing them apart, studying them, and putting them back with new features or defects uh, fixed, etc. Th then you should really consider to become a free and open source developer. A side effect of this is that if you write good software and you're passionate about it, um, at some point your software, your software will become part of your CV. So the good companies that hire good software developers will check your GitHub page uh, to see if you actually can write software, can, uh, if you're able to, to solve problems uh, uh, that you had in the past, etc. So just put some, uh, some time in it. It's not just lost, but if you, if you actually believe in the project, uh, it will come, come back. It will, uh, it will come back in the a, in a form of uh, profit for yourself as a professional software developer. And of course, one thing that you need to absolutely do absolutely, is coming to FOSDEM. Because FOSDEM uh, is, uh, is more than just a conference. It's just celebrating uh, the, the beauty of our m magnificent community of more than uh, 7,000 uh, hackers because they like to, to wear funny t-shirts where they say that, uh, that they, they believe in these um, ethic points that, uh, that, that, that we've been through. And of course, we have a lot of other things. We have beer. Uh, we have a week of talks just concentrated in, uh, uh, in, in just a single weekend. That's, that's the best uh, definition I've got from Frozen. It was from a, from a tweet from that guy uh, exactly this year. And uh, we have beer. We have communities uh, that meet up, especially on Frozen. There is people that you can only meet at Frozen. Uh, so there is open source, there is free software, and there is beer. Did I mention there is beer? Uh, and uh, so I'll see you in February at FOSDEM. But meanwhile, uh, I don't know, I probably got really tight with the time. But uh, uh, if you have questions uh, or things that you want to discuss with me, I'll leave you this. This is uh, all my contacts. So you, you can actually confront me on the things I said. And if there is something that you don't like especially, please let's start a conversation about it. And, uh, uh, I'm even uh, going to, uh, to publish these slides uh, 
uh, with, with Creative Commons. So if someone wants to add things or uh, hate me for a specific thing I put in there, I'm just open to everything. So yes, thank you very much. And uh, thanks a lot for your time. I hope that uh, it was not so too boring and uh, you actually got something from this. Thank you.